Hey everyone, and welcome back to Policy Punchline. Here at the show, we interview scholars, policymakers, and business executives on urgent issues and frontier ideas in our world today. I'm Princeton junior James Cross. And I'm Princeton freshman Maddie Feldman. And we're so excited to welcome Mr. Aaron Klein to the show. Aaron Klein is the Miriam K. Carliner Chair and Senior Fellow of Economic Studies at the Brookings Institution, specializing in financial technology, regulation, payments, macroeconomics, and infrastructure finance. Prior to joining Brookings in 2016, he directed the Bipartisan Policy Center's Financial Regulatory Reform Initiative, and from 2009 to 2012, Klein served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy at the Department of the Treasury, heavily contributing to financial regulatory reform, the Dodd-Frank Act, and addressing the economic crisis of 2008. He's also served as Chief, Chief Economist of the Senate Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs Committee, actively involved in major legislation, including TARP and housing finance reform. Klein is a graduate of Dartmouth College and Princeton's own School of Public and International Affairs. Mr. Klein, welcome to the show. It's great to be back at Princeton. So we wanted to start off with a question just about your career. And specifically, if you could talk a little bit about what brought you from Princeton SPIA to working in Washington uh, at the heart of the Senate during the financial crisis. Well, uh, it was a series of fortunate and unplanned events. Uh, life has a serendipity to it, a butterfly effect, a chaos theory. You can put yourself in the best situation you can, and then you have to cross your fingers a little bit. So when I graduated from S uh, SPIA, uh, it was 2000. And I was unusual. Uh, most uh, of my classmates had some work experience. I had gone straight through from undergraduate. Uh, the dot-com bubble was busting. Uh, I was also, I'll be honest with you, a little tired after the 18th grade. Uh, I think there's some real benefits of doing graduate school straight through and some real drawbacks and costs. So I didn't, I, I, I tried to do some recruiting straight out of SPIA. It didn't really work. I, I wasn't the right fit. Uh, for a variety of reasons that I've come to appreciate. At the time, I thought, you know, we're, we're nuts, right? Like my hair was a little long and the consulting and investment banking crowd didn't like that. But, you know, it, it actually says something more about me, uh, which is right. I tried for a job at the New York Fed. I tried for a few different jobs. So then I took a little bit of time off and I traveled, you know, saw some concerts, saw some friends, saw the world a little bit. And it was uh, it was time to get a job. And the career services uh, I had at Princeton were exceptional. There was a wonderful woman, Anne, who's who's just amazing, and the full career services, they were on me. So they, they started me on a network, the Princeton network of people in Capitol Hill. I knew I wanted to work in Congress. I knew I wanted to work in the legislative branch. Uh, I had a call for public service when I was young. Uh, I tried to get a job at the state of Maryland. I'm a Marylander. Uh, and uh, um, I, I tried a bunch of different things. And I just started passing my resume around. And lo and behold, my resume ended up with a great Princetonian, Marty Grunberg, who today is the chairman of the FDIC, but at the time was a senior counsel on the Senate Banking Committee working for another great Princetonian, Paul Sarbanes, class of 54. And Senator Sarbanes, Maryland senior senator and the lead Democrat on the committee, was looking for a numbers person, an economist. And the stars aligned. Uh, there was a lot of Princeton connection in there, but there was also the you know, opportunity and, and capability. Uh, I interviewed well. And at the time, the U.S. Senate was split 50-50. The Republicans were still in control. The Bush election had, had happened. Uh, later, uh, Senator Jeffords from Vermont would switch parties and throw control to Democrats. But generally before that, the Senate funding for committees was split 60-40, majority-minority. So they decided under power sharing to make the money 50-50. So uh, uh, in politics, in math, there are several ways to get to equality when you start at 60-40. Uh, uh, you might naturally think, oh, well, then you just bump up, bu drop 60 down to 50 and 40 up to 50. That's one way to do it. Politics can be more creative. One is take the people who are 40, give them the same amount of money that people who are at 60 and call it even. So the committee had some, so the committee had some extra funds and were hiring. Uh, and I was very fortunate to get a job. I will be honest with you, I was not quote unquote qualified for that job in the sense that there were a long list of people who'd worked in the Clinton administration, who'd worked in other areas of policy, who were more qualified and experienced. Uh, I think that's a pattern. I'm not sure I've been qualified for any of the jobs I've had. I like to also think I've done very well at all of those jobs. So I urge the students who are listening to think 
about about what qualification means. Does qualification mean if given the opportunity you could succeed in it? Or does qualification mean having handled what you think are the proper prerequisites to be able to succeed? It's an interesting question. So that's how I got on the committee. It was life-changing. Uh, I, I, I thank um, the staff director, uh, uh, Steve Harris, who, who was, went to Dartmouth, Marty Gruenberg and, and Paul Sarbanes, who are great Princetonians. Uh, you know, when you work for a senator, you work for that senator. And that senator is the key point in your office. I've had the great privilege of working for both Senator Sarbanes and Senator Dodd, and then later working for Secretary Geithner and President Obama. Uh, and those have just been amazing opportunities. And I'm very lucky and blessed to have done it. Uh, and Princeton absolutely played a key role in it. Well, yes. Yeah, so that's an encouragement to everyone here. Get on the Princeton Alumni Network. You may end up as the chief economist uh, for the senator, the lead senator on the banking committee during a financial crisis. And that's exactly what happened to you. I want to ask you about your experience in Congress during the financial crisis. There's definitely sort of a popular narrative, both about how the financial crisis unfolded, uh, the, the big short, sort of a common conception of it. Uh, what might the Written public- Written by be a great Princetonian, Michael Lewis, who I, who I think all of his books were fantastic up until the last one. The Sam Bankman- Yeah, 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 yeah. He, he seems to have botched that one. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, was, I was curious, what, what insights can you give us from being on the inside of, uh, of the Senate Banking Committee uh, during the crisis and sort of looking back, you know, what is it, 15 years later, looking back, are there any sort of lessons that you've learned um, that, that we have now? Well, so the lessons learned could fill the rest of the right. podcast and maybe two confessionals uh, afterwards. Uh, let me give you, a, let, let me start by trying to fight some common misconceptions and some false narratives that people in your generation and the broader American public have heard. The first is no one saw this coming. That's just false. In 2002, we were well aware of subprime mortgage problems. In 2001, we were aware of them. Senator Sarbanes held hearings on them when the Democrats were in control. I will never forget, never, where I was the morning of September 11, 2001, which was in a hearing on the failure of Superior Bank FSB, the first bank to fail as a result of its valuation of subprime mortgages. 2001, we had a hearing on it. I will acknowledge that hearing was overtaken by events. It was actually canceled by the police. It's the only hearing I've ever been in where the Capitol Police ended the hearing, not the chairman. But we knew that this was a huge problem. We were pounding the Federal Reserve to do something. The Federal Reserve was required by law to promulgate regulations on subprime mortgages. The Home Ownership and Equity Protection Act, HOEPA, of 1994 required the Fed to promulgate subprime mortgage regulations. That law said the Fed shall, not may, right? When you write law, and this is a broader point, when you work in Congress, you think you have this amazing hard power called law. And then you have this soft power, hearings, letters, questions for the record, press conferences. During my time in Congress and the way my career unfolded, I did Congress first. Sometimes I wish I could Benjamin Button the whole thing. Uh, I hope that cultural reference works still. I overestimated the value of hard power and I underestimated the value of soft power. I underestimated the change that happened by simply scheduling a hearing or asking the right questions. And I overemphasized what it meant when I hard coded something into law. So my colleagues before me hard coded, the Fed, hard -coded this. Federal Reserve shall issue regulations on subprime mortgages. 1994, the law is passed. Why don't you guys guess? When do you think the Fed codified this regulation? Matty, I'll let you get this one. Oof, I'm gonna go with, uh, you said, when was the law? The law was passed in 1994. Let's go with a few sessions later. Give me a year. 2003. Let's... What do you think? 99. The correct answer is 2007. Oops. <laughs> By the Just time. In time. <laughs> yeah. In fact, but there was a, a Ned Graham, like as a governor of the Fed, uh, wanted to do it earlier. And he went to Fed Chairman Greenspan and he said, you know, there's a subprime mortgage thing. It's starting to pop in the late 90s. We're required to write these laws. You know, there's some issues. And Greenspan said, no, the market will handle it. I read this book by Ann Rand. You know, we government can't overregulate things. Um, uh, you know, banks aren't going to make loans to people who won't pay them back. And he just didn't do it. And the Federal Reserve had accumulated enough power 
to ignore the law. And that's what happened. So the first misconception is nobody knew, right? People were, we were having hearings on this. Even when I worked for Chairman Dodd in 2007, we had a hearing where somebody said they were gonna be Martin Eakes, uh, another Princetonian, I might add, I believe, for this, founded the Center for Responsible Lending and Self-Help Credit Union in North Carolina. Uh, Martin testified there'd be a wave, tsunami of 2 million foreclosures, and he was laughed out of the room by all the quote unquote serious people. Wow. Martin was wrong. There were 5 million foreclosures, <laughs> yeah. not two. Um, so that's the first myth misconception. People knew about it. People were raising the red flag and they were being ignored by the consensus which said, don't worry about it. Right. Uh, the second thing, uh, during the crisis, it was all hands on deck. I worked every single day, nonstop. I didn't come home, I slept on the sofa, if I slept at all, right? With the exception of the Jewish holidays, I worked every single day for, you know, whatever it was, 45 days. Uh, when TARP was voted down the first time by the House, there was no plan B. We walked in, we had a deal, all the principals had signed off, and the uh, votes were not properly counted in the House. And that, when I remember running past somebody from the White House, uh, and the Treasury Department, after the vote, it went down, and I looked at him, and I'm like, so what's the plan? And he's like, we don't have one. And that was terrifying. And the reason I think the markets reacted so precipitously when the House voted down TARP was that they didn't know who they could trust, who was in charge. Because when this, when the president and the head of the minority party, when the speaker, when, when, when all those dynamics line up and there's a revolt by the rank and file, predominantly House Republicans, they didn't know what to do. Uh, so we had to come up with one. And it was all hands on deck. It was very, very bipartisan. It was very, very much in the spirit of, we have to solve this problem. And uh, I formed a lot of bonds and friendship there. Uh, uh, you know, friends across the aisle, friends across the political spectrum, friends who would go on to work in the Trump administration. Uh, it, it, it was not, the picture that you're shown is, you know, these people that scream and hate each other and about to fight each other. Uh, behind the scenes, when I was in Congress, you know, there was a bit of that for the cameras, not nearly as much. We didn't have social media. But ultimately, at the end of the day, you worked with the person because you honestly believe the person on the other side of the aisle was in it to make the world a better place. They may have had a different philosophy than yours about what would make the world a better place. And there are reasonable people who can say the opposite of what I believe with true motivation and intention, and then you try to work to find compromise. And I've always enjoyed that spirit of compromise, thinking it makes a better product. I'm not sure it always does, but generally speaking, I think it, uh, a, a good process will create a better product. Right. And in terms of the process for the policy, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the policies themselves, um, specifically two, and I guess we can cover them in whichever order. Uh, but one would be TARP, um, which eventually did pass um, and was proved to be crucial, really, uh, for, for pre pre uh, preventing a total financial meltdown. In the COVID pandemic, uh, the Fed set up new sorts of lending facilities uh, to try to ensure that there wasn't a market crash. Uh, how do you compare those two crises and the lessons learned from TARP and, and yeah, in many ways I, its, its success? I think, I think we took a lot of the wrong lessons from TARP. And let me, let me start with a couple things. I'll start with a fun story. The original proposal was TARA. The two and a half page proposal that came from the Bush White House was called the Trouble Asset uh, Relief Auction. They wanted to have this reverse auction of securities. And um, one, a reverse auction wasn't going to work. The way the structure of the problem had metastasized beyond the point where there were things. And we needed capital injections into the banks. That was not something that the administration wanted to do uh, for a variety of reasons. They did not want to do it. So we jammed them. We said, no, no, you have to create this as an option. And they would tell us in briefings, you can write the law that will let us do it. We're still doing our auction. We said, you can tell me you're doing the auction, but the auction ain't going to work. I understand the theory. It's really good, but like maybe that would have worked six months ago. We're, we're past that. 
in addition, we, we asked ourselves, when you work in uh, uh, public policy, you're simultaneously dealing with substance and messaging. And I want to get back to this thesis of substance and messaging because we took the wrong messaging in TARP and the right substance, and COVID relief policies had the right messaging and the wrong substance. So, what is if I say Tara, what do you guys think of? A uh, name. <laughs> yeah, a name. Any specific name? Do, do, does it conjure anything in literature and popular culture? Or am I just way past my skis on this? A little bit, but maybe like more of a feminine. Feminine? Like princess energy, like tiara almost. <laughs> so Tara is the name of the plantation in Gone with the Wind. The famous movie about kind of the lost South and, and this or that. Tara is the plantation that, that, that after the Civil War, uh, you know, has all these issues in, in Gone with the Wind. That's not the image that you want in a financial crisis, <laughs> nor was it the right policy. So on the committee, we were a lot of baseball fans. I'm a big baseball fan. A lot of the rest of us were big baseball fans. And we thought to ourselves and we said, what's the right message here? Well, if I say the word tarp, what do you think of? Shelter, security. Right. There's a rainstorm coming. You bring out the tarp. You cover the field. The rain passes, you take the tarp off, and you go back and you play, right? You don't need the tarp very much, but when you need it, you need it, and it's okay. And you need it because there's an emergency. So we renamed the program, and we restructured it so that you could inject capital into the banks. The bank capital injections that occurred in tarp turned a profit for the American taxpayer. So at the end of the rescue, right, we authorized $700 billion dollars, not all of it was deployed. You needed to authorize more than what you had so that the market didn't feel like there was a finite resource and they could outrun you. So you purposefully had to put more money aside than you knew you would need. And we had to manage how that money was rolled off because keep in mind, we're passing this in 40 days before an election, 30 days, October uh, 3rd. So we're passing this before an election then we don't know the outcome of the election. It seemed like President Obama was going to win, but you weren't positive. Uh, uh, later elections would show you can't always trust the polls. Um, two, uh, uh, we were going to have a, a, a different impression than what President Bush was doing. So we needed to save some of the money. We didn't know how long the crisis was going to last. But we structured it so that you'd get paid back. Equity injections in the bank would get paid off. We had warrants, stock options. Senator Reid of Rhode Island was very focused on this, something we'd done before in capital injections. You know, let American public share in the upside. So if you look at all the money that was put into the banks, 500 or so billion dollars, and everything that was paid back, the U.S. taxpayer got paid back more. The deficit is smaller, just flows. Forget about the macroeconomic effects of stabilizing the economy. But the American public heard a $700 billion gift to the banks. They heard capital injections and they thought the money was gone. They saw banker bonuses and they figured that's where it went and the money was gone. They don't realize that that was profitable, United States taxpayer, the bank portion of TARP. COVID relief comes. COVID relief is a series of loan of grants described as loans. So TARP was a, uh, uh, a loan hidden as a grant. It was hidden as a grant in a way because we wanted to instill confidence in the bank. You knew the bank was solved. The U.S. government stood behind it. And so even though the bank owed the government the money back, right, you didn't feel like the bank was, you, the, the bank was more stable. The Paycheck Protection Program, all these COVID things were loans. Nobody had to pay the Paycheck Protection ba uh, PPP money back. Right. You didn't really even, you know, you, you needed very, very loose things that you were going to, um, uh, you know, not use the money for, uh, uh, you know, for payroll. Well, you know who got PPP money? The L.A. Lakers. They're a small business. The predominance of it goes to payroll. Does, were they going to re release LeBron James? You know who else got PPP money? Most of the fancy elite private schools in America. Do you think they were going to fire their science teacher? Do you think they needed the money? Uh, you know, you know, a lot of a lot of uh, Princetonians go to some of these schools. They got the money under the guise of COVID relief. This was not a targeted thing. 
These were loans that were grants. They, they, they were not meant to be paid back, nor were they. The screens and filters were very loose. I sat on the TARP review board. These banks had to go through a lot of stages to even qualify for the funds. And so, you know, I, I think one of the things that happened in COVID relief was we thought, well, the TARP thing worked well, injecting money into the financial system when we had a financial crisis. So in COVID, let's inject money into the through the financial system to respond to this. And I think it was a huge mistake. I think the programs were ill-designed, ill-targeted, rife with fraud, and ultimately, uh, you know, created a, a beneficiary class. You see some of these uh, people driving around with luxury cars with license plates that say PPP on it. I mean, it's kind of sickening. Well, you mentioned, I think on a Zoom, like a really long time ago, <clears throat> that Congress should model more after the Europeans, like so less on the PPP programs and more through direct grants to small businesses, um, you know, as one of the methods of yeah. economic recovery. Do you look towards international economic structure often when you're thinking about how to draft legislation or are you constantly thinking about how to reconcile with you know gridlock in congress and what's doable on home turf uh, look I, I i'm a very proud american <laughs> but the most proud american ought to be able to realize that we don't have a, a unique lock on all of the answers globally yeah. and you need to look at the rest of the world for what succeeded and what's failed yeah. and you need to think about that uh, and so the answer to your question is yes. I frequently look at how other countries are handling similar problems and what are they doing better or worse. Often America is the best, but not always. Uh, I, I did a tremendous amount of work on, on payments. That's kind of like been a huge thing. And a lot of it was spawned off of a trip in China where I saw these Chinese payment apps that were running systems way better, cheaper, faster than ours. All right, last night uh, I, I met a friend for beers at Alchemist and I walk in and there's a big sign on it that says, you know, 3% surcharge for cards, no Apple, no Apple pay. I saw that on your Twitter. Right. So why? Right. Well, they don't want to pay the 4 5% right. surcharge. And there's a whole set of reasons that doesn't exist in, the, in other countries in the world. Why, did, why is their payment system better, cheaper, quicker, faster, and more fair for small businesses than ours? There's a lot to learn from that. And if you close yourself off there... I think you're making a huge mistake. Ultimately, though, you have to justify your policy choices, the best decision for Americans. And Americans, I think, are somewhat more than the rest of the world not willing to go along because the rest of the world is doing it. Right? We don't have the metric system. <laughs> right? There are a lot of examples where, okay, maybe it's better, maybe it's worse, but we're not just going to go along to go along. So you have to say, listen, this is a better system for you. And then it kind of overcomes that hurdle. But in terms of scholarship and academia, absolutely. You, 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 I think you have to. You know, Economics is trying to find natural experiments where they don't exist. And sometimes, and by the way, I often look at things that states are doing. States are a great laboratory of democracy. Why is this state doing it this way and that state's doing it that way? And what can I learn from this that could be applicable at a national level? I, I, I do that a lot. I, I wrote a paper on college admissions at public universities, and I think North Carolina and Texas have a much better system of admissions at public universities than other states. Uh, and I wish other states would adopt their system. I can debate which one of the two is better, but they're better than the other 48, including my great state of Maryland, which I'm loath to ever admit is not best at everything. <laughs> Um, so in terms of sort of interesting um, comparative crises, uh, I, I thought this would be sort of relevant to, to Maggie, uh, Maddie's question about um, comparison across different countries. The, the March banking crisis um, sort of started in the United States, Silicon Valley Bank, uh, but it was contagious and, and Credit Suisse went down, um, got bought by UBS. Uh, I, I want to ask what your thoughts were on the the Fed's supervisory failures um, during during the banking crisis, and even if more broadly you had any thoughts on the the Dodd Frank bill that you, you had a huge part in writing, the the Trump rollback of it to some extent, uh, and how that factored into um, the sort of mini banking crisis we had last spring. Sure. So so let me give you an answer that you may not be expecting. I don't think the Trump rollback was why there was a crisis at Silicon Valley Bank. It is a convenient scapegoat that fits a common narrative 
of kind of the Democrats regulate, the Republicans deregulate, and the deregulation causes the problem. There's certainly instances where that's true. As a matter of fact, this was not one of them. The problems at Silicon Valley Bank were obvious and clear. The authorities given to the Fed were not meaningfully curtailed in the 2018 uh, rollback. However, all legislation, whether it was Dodd-Frank or the 2018 bill, is about you know authorities, rules. You cannot legislate judgment. Congress cannot write in a law, you're going to have good judgment, <laughs> right? You know, your, your, your parents raise you, they try to instill values in you, and then you're confronted with a, 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 a moment and you have to make a choice. They can't set up the choice. They can set up consequences to your choices, right? Uh, the Federal Reserve regulated Silicon Valley Bank from head to toe. They had all the authority they needed to do anything they wanted to that institution to mitigate it blowing itself up. The 2018 rollback didn't change that, and the Fed screwed it up. And that is absolutely their failure as a regulator, first and foremost. And we can discuss what that means. The globalization of the financial system, the second part of your question, is an inherent reality. We have globalized trade in goods, commerce, and finance. And these have uh, long-lasting consequences. Some are positive, some are negative. They uh, create a more efficient system. They can create a less equitable system. It's not necessarily a win for everybody, and it can be difficult to monitor the rules. The United States plays a unique role, not just because we're the largest economy in the world, but because the dollar is the de facto world currency. And dollars can only be created in the United States. We'll hold aside the euro dollar phenomenon as a technical matter for a, a subsequent conversation. And so the United States has to play a slightly different role in global financial system. I think the problems at Credit Suisse were a little unique to Credit Suisse. The Switzerland situation is different. Switzerland plays a very different role in the global financial system than other countries, right? Switzerland has banks that are larger than the country, right? Even if the TARP showed in the U.S., the sovereign can always bail out the bank, right? The Swiss franc plays a very different role in international finance. Most currencies are set as a result of demand and supply. Sometimes they're manipulated, but Switzerland markets its currency as a safe haven, so that during times of stress, the franc will behave differently than economic textbooks would do because it's not being marketed on the basis of Swiss trade. It's being marketed as a financial instrument that if you know crazy stuff happens, you'll have access to the money. Different thing. So, you know, I, I, I don't think you can draw the quite straight line domino between SVB, First Republic, and Credit Suisse. You, it's a different structure, which is more that when confidence is shaken, institutions that have low confidence feel the reverberation. And if you think about finance, finance is ultimately trust. And trust is the paramount thing. And when trust uh, shrinks, behavior changes radically. And trust can evaporate very quickly. And, of course, that's a sort of what you were talking about before with giving enough money to the Bush administration to make sure that the, not only could they pay it, but the market thinks that they can inject enough capital capital um, into the banks. Uh, I wanted to um, address a question that is related to the Fed's supervision of SVB, which is that you don't think the Fed should really regulate banks. Could you explain um, that position? And, and Right. So... Uh, I'll harken back to, to Senator Sarbanes, Princeton class of 54. He was a trustee, a brilliant man, very proud of his Greek heritage. And there's a word in, in ancient Greek called telos, which is your true North Star, your guiding philosophy, your principle, right? Ancient Greek philosophy. And everybody, every organization can only have one number one priority, one true North Star. If you ask, I was just at a panel uh, uh, in London and a room full of bankers and hedge funds and investors, and this topic came up, and I said, listen, each of you works for a company. All right? There are 200 of you in this room. If I ask you what's your company's number one priority, and you come back to me and you give me a list of five things, you have no number one priority. You can't have five number one priorities. It doesn't work like that. Your number one priority 
sets an entire agenda and tone because nothing is more important than your number one priority, right? And you should be able to identify that. My number one priority in my life are my children and my family, period. That's it. I have a lot of other priorities. <laughs> I've been on the road all week. I miss my, my family very much. My career is incredibly important to me, but it's not my number one priority. It's, it's an important priority, but it's not my number one. So what's the Federal Reserve's number one priority? Dual, dual mandate. What, what do you mean by that? Um, uh, maximum uh, employment and price stability. I was thinking financial security. Financial security. I would say monetary policy, right? Which is the, what you say, the dual mandate is their statutory obligation to conduct monetary policy to meet this, but it's setting the interest rate. It's changing the economy. It's, per your comment, you know, financial uh, growth. The Fed actually lists their top five priorities. You can read it in their Silicon Valley bank report. Their number one priority is monetary policy. Their number two priority is economic statistics, research, and information that helps conduct monetary policy. The Federal Reserve employs more PhD economists than any other entity in America, including Princeton, which has its fair share. Um, its number three priority is bank supervision and regulation. Its number four priority is financial stability, and its number five priority is the payment system. Getting back to my earlier comment, you wonder why America's payment system is, is a horrific and a joke compared to the rest of the world? It's the number five priority. That tends not to get answered as much. So, you know, I have come to the belief that America has a lot of financial regulators. Uh, this is largely because we didn't have national bank chartering until the Civil War. My favorite Republican president, Abraham Lincoln, created the National Bank Act. Before that, we only had state chartered banks. Uh, one thing that uh, I think school doesn't do a great job of explaining is the path dependency of policy. So often you're taught like, here are the issues, what's the optimal policy? And it comes back to this theorem, which is true in, in physical sciences that, you know, and true in math, right, that you try to find equilibria. And the idea is there's an equilibria, there's the right path. And the answer, how you get to the path then becomes a transition issue, right? Wherever you were, you, first you identify the right path, then you figure out where you are, and then you try to get from where you are to where you need to be. There's a different way of looking at it, which is path dependency right? Uh, uh, it's like if you're driving somewhere from home. Maybe there was an optimal route when you left your house to get there, but now you've made three wrong turns and the route to get where you need to go is very different. So we have a path-dependent policy society. We have a lot of financial regulators because we have a dual chartered system between state and federal banks, and we will always have a dual chartered system, and that's a good thing, and we should get the maximum value we can out of that. We have entities whose number one priority is bank regulation. They should be regulating banks because they will do a better job. Will they get it perfect? No. Will they make mistakes? Absolutely. Will they wake up with their number one leader focused on nothing but bank regulation? Absolutely. And that will never occur at the Fed. The Fed will always be focused on monetary policy, and that's a good thing. That's fine, right? I, I am not, I think there's a, a hesitancy when you say the Federal Reserve shouldn't be doing this job to say, oh, well, you're anti-Fed. No, no, no. I'm pro-Fed. I'm pro organizations focusing on their core competency. And I think government does best when you identify that core competency and then you, you know, try to align mandate with competency and, and objectives. And so, you know, in one of the papers I wrote, I called the, the, the Fed's growing remit in society the curse of competence. Because they've been good at monetary policy, they've been given all these other things. Because, the, because TARP succeeded in stabilizing the, the banking system, the idea was, well, these guys can help inject capital into small businesses and figure out, where, right? That's the mistake that we've made, which is assuming competency in A broadens remit for competency in B. And uh, an almost perfect corollary of this is payment systems. And uh, you, you wrote a paper recently uh, arguing that, well, I'll let you argue it, but uh, sort of, Looking at the Fed's responsibility as both a payment systems operator and regulator, particularly in light of the new Fed Now um, payment system, which rolled out this summer, can you talk about uh, a little bit about how this, you know, this Telos issue uh, comes up in the payment system? Yeah. A absolutely. So let me let me start for the folks who haven't been in the weeds on this, right? Because we all operate the payment system, and we assume a system because 
you think it is the way it is. So I'm pulling out my phone to check, right? We're taping today is Thursday, November 16th. We can all agree on this. So let's say a couple things. Let's say that you're getting paid on Friday, the 17th. Let's say it's a direct deposit, right? So the money pops on your bank account Friday, the 17th. I think Maddie's smiling. Maybe that's her payday. When do you think your employer sent it? Yeah, they sent it Tuesday. Why? Because in order to get from the employer to you, they have to send it on Tuesday to make sure it gets there on Friday. Right? Imagine, right? You could, right? This system, if you gave me a paper check and you handed it to me at the end of the day on Friday, the 17th, or even at the beginning of work, but I can't get out, right? Or even if I take a picture of it on my phone, I actually wrote the law that lets you take a picture of a check on a phone. How many of you guys have had to deal with that with your grandparents or great aunt or great uncle, right? I, 2000, uh, the uh, 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 check act, um, I, I helped write that. Uh, we didn't even think of phones. It was about ATMs back then. We were still using things called Blackberries when we wrote that law, uh, check 21 act. So why is that money not available until Monday, November 20th? Why isn't it available instantly? Right. The answer to that question is because the payment clearing system that we use is called an automatic clearinghouse or an ACH, which assembles all of the payments together. And it's like laundry. I'm going to hope that you kids have all been doing your laundry by now. Uh, you, you, you take all the you hold a bunch of clothes so you get enough dirty clothes. You put it in the machine, you run the machine and they all come out clean together. Right. Nothing comes out clean first ahead of anything else. It doesn't matter when you wore it. Right, it just assembles. So that's how our payment system has operated since the 1950s. Uh, 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 you, you know, you assemble all the payments, you run them through the machine, and then boom. It's called batch processing, is another word. So that's what the technology allowed way back when. Well, now you can run payments directly, instantly. Right? Think of it as streaming. Right? You guys, do you guys even? You guys don't remember Blockbuster? Distant memory? No. Yeah, you're going along old guy, right? Like, you used to have to drive to the movie store. They had all the movies. You picked one and you went back, right? Now you stream, right? You call up Netflix and boom, there it is. Like Netflix used to send little, your parents would have these little little packages with the movie. You had to send away for it. The rest of the world did that. Mexico did it. Brazil did it. Uh, the Bank of England did it in 2008. Europe did it. It was very complicated across the European Union. A lot of individual countries had done it. They'd done it in France. They'd done it in Poland. But then how do you get from France to Poland? All these people invested in this a long time ago. The U.S. didn't. Why not? Well, the Federal Reserve studied it. It wasn't sure. Should it do it? Should a private sector? So here's the other thing. The Federal Reserve regulates the rules of it, but they also operate one of the largest ones. So if Blockbuster had been in charge of the regulations that allow Netflix, would they have allowed it? No, they would have protected their franchise. In addition, something else is pernicious in the United States. There's, let's divide Americans into two groups of people. The group of people who always have a thousand bucks in their bank account and the group of people that don't. If you always have a thousand bucks in your bank account, it doesn't matter to you whether your paycheck is available on Friday or Monday. You can still do whatever you want in the weekends. But if you don't, a weird phenomenon happens. The less money you have, the more money it costs you to access your own money. So let's take a look at something called overdraft. If you go below the zero bank thing in your bank account, the bank charges you typically 35 bucks per transaction. Overdraft, by some estimates, is a 15 to $35 billion a year cash cow. The money is, it's almost all pure profit because as soon as you get paid, the money comes right back. There's a bank CEO in Minnesota who named his yacht Overdraft. Who pays overdrafts? One in 12 Americans pay three, have 10 or more overdrafts a year. They constitute 80% of the overdrafts. 8% of Americans are 80% of the overdrafts. For these people, overdraft is a huge thing. 350 bucks a year or more of their income. It's small amount of people paying a tremendous amount. These customers are profitable for banks just on their overdraft revenue. Then you find a bunch of banks and unfortunately some credit unions too who target these customers. 
who then figure out ways. Well, let's reorder your transactions on your debit card during the day, not from time of pay, but from biggest to smallest, right? Which you can do because they're just sitting in a batch. There's no law against this. There's no rule against this because of ACH, right? And by the way, you don't actually know as a consumer how much money is in your bank account, right? You can have an overdraft when it, you, you pull up your app and it says you have $32 and you buy a $6 cup of coffee. Oh, but there was a payment processing that you didn't know about, your direct thing from the gym, and they came and that, they backed that out, right? Somehow our bank account is, you know, like the, you know, the, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, right, in physics. Like how can you not know the balance in your bank account? Um, and it's all because of this slow payment system. And the rest of the world went and got rid of this. Huge benefits. By my calculation, if the Federal Reserve had required real-time funds availability in 2008, the same time the Bank of England set it up, uh, there'd be over $100 billion moved from, low, from banks, check cashers, payday lenders, back into the hands of this 50% of Americans who run out of money and the 8% who are heavy overdrafters. And instead, that just went to pure profit in these financial services folks. Now, let's put the flip side. A lot of the banks the Fed regulate depend on overdraft for their revenue. They, I've identified a series of banks, predominantly small banks, for whom overdraft is 50 to 300% of their net profit. DBA First Texas has made more than 100% of its profit on overdraft in the last nine years. And I say nine because the data didn't exist before then, but I'm pretty confident it was before that. That's not regulated by the Fed. It's regulated by the OCC. And Comptroller Sue, if you're listening, why do you give that bank a clean regulatory bill of health? Because it is not a bank. It is a check casher with a charter. And this gets to the final point I want to make on this payments position. If you want to read the whole paper, you can download it. It was published by Wharton. Don't get mad at me for, for publishing through Penn. I taught there uh, last semester. Um, it is that uh, um, we... In, in, in our society, have built a reverse Robin Hood at the cash register. We have built a payment system that is predicated on charging those with less and redistributing it to those with more. Free checking, if you have more than $1,000 in your account, is often subsidized by these heavy overdraft fees. I think as a matter of policy, that is wrong. I do not think the payment system should be a reverse Robin Hood. I do not think that a society that showers benefits on people with money at the expense of people without. It also leads us to fundamentally misidentify problems in research. So when I started in policy, this idea of the financially underserved, like check cashing customers, it was all about, well, they don't have a bank account. So if we can get them into the banking system, we'll solve their problem. Check cashing is very expensive. Uh, so one day, I was uh, Saturday morning, I'd just taken my daughter's ice skating. And after a little ice skating lesson in the rink in downtown Silver Spring, we go into the bank, and I'm going to do a little bit, bit of my banking. And there's a woman in front of me at the teller who's yelling at the teller about when her check's going to deposit. She was depositing the check on a Saturday. It wasn't going to be available till Thursday. Monday was a holiday. You know, overdrafts. And she was getting more and more mad. And this other woman walks up to her, puts her hand on her shoulder, says, I got you. Go around the corner, go to the check cashier, come back, put in the cash. It'll be instant. She said, you solved the problem. Oh my God, check cashers is 20 bucks, right? Overdrafts are 35 each. And I knew she was going to have at least two from overhearing her conversation with the teller. And I thought to myself, good Lord, a different way to look at this problem is three people walk into a bank. One person has the problem. One person has the answer. And the third person thinks they're an expert on financial services, particularly for the underserved. <laughs> I'm the third person here. That put me on a quest for years until I finally was able to show mathematically through survey data, that 70% of people who use check cashers have a bank account. So now, if 70% of... So this isn't an anecdote, right? My experience was anecdotal. But mathematically, I could show this at a societal level. So why? Why are they going... We thought people were going to check cashers because they didn't have a bank account. If you got them into a, banking, a bank account, you solved their problem. No. What's their problem? Their problem is the bank isn't giving them the service they want, real-time funds. Check casher, what do they give you? Cash. Where can you use it? You know, almost anywhere, right? And if you need to make it electronic, you can bring it back to your bank account. 
And so this is another reason why this delay in payment clearing has been so pernicious. It drives people to check cashers. And instead, right, what's the policy solution? A financial literacy pamphlet extolling the benefits of a bank account issued by the same agency that's not making the bank give you their money faster, the same agency that's looking at these banks' profits from overdraft and saying, oh, good, we need bank profitability in the system. And they haven't regulated some of the most pernicious overdrafts. Do you think a bank should be able to reorder your payments from biggest to smallest on your debit card and not time of day to maximize overdraft revenue? Do you think that's fair? No. no right? That's not a partisan issue, I don't think. I know, you know, Republicans, less regulation, Democrats, more regulation, right? But there's basic principles of fairness, right? You know, if I look on my account, if I overdraft, I overdraft. A lot of people overdraft, they know they're overdrafting. But the idea that at the end of the day, you're going to reorder my transactions to maximize the number of overdrafts? Come on, man. That's not fair. That's not right. And that should be a common sense rule. And nobody's done it yet. I have hopes that this Consumer Financial Protection Bureau will do it. But the practice is rampant at banks and credit unions. Not all, by the way. Credit unions, according to some survey data, are more likely to do it than banks. So don't don't think that there's a you know a good guy in a, that it's all pure quote unquote profit. Right? Credit unions are supposed to be nonprofit. That can be a subject for another day. Um, so I just wanted to ask, what 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 does the path forward look like? What what does an egalitarian um, payments operation system look like? And you know, do you tie that into the central bank digital currency conversation? And also, do you think given this year of volatility in Congress, even just like an, another impending shutdown, is Congress even able to codify a new set of regulations that could potentially move the onus towards other agencies like FDIC, for example? So let me let me take the second question and, and, and then the first, and I'll take it in the following. The currently, uh, we have s tremendous gridlock in Washington. We've had it for a long time. Uh, I, I remember Senator Dodd would often talk about his father's experience in the United States Senate in the 50s when they couldn't pass the civil rights bill. And there were, you know, the anti-lynching bills and the huge filibusters that were going and, and this feeling that there was this huge structural problem in, in society and Congress just wasn't up to the task. And it was true. And then all of a sudden the dam bursts. And in the 60s, there was this fantastic window where major civil rights advancements are made. And so I would answer your question in the sense that is Congress in the next few months likely to do meaningful structural financial reform? No. And at that moment, there were a lot of things put into Dodd-Frank in that moment where there was it, right? And so a lot of the research, a lot of the reason why research is so critically important is when that moment hits, you're, you, you don't have time to come up with the answer. It's a time to implement the answers that other people have thought about when that moment isn't there. And so that's what I'm trying to contribute to the scholarship there. That's what I think other folks. Second question. I don't think, I, I, central bank digital currency, I have yet to understand the reason for. And I'll explain it to you. Central bank digital currency is often called CBDC or it's supposed to be digital cash. Okay, we all have CBDC. Commercial bank digital currency. Right, we have different types of digital currency. Right, Maddie was kind enough to 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 get this coffee with paw points. You called it. Yeah, they're the Princeton digital currency. Yeah. They're digital currency at Princeton. Right, they move around. Your account gets debited and credited. Right, they're digital currency. Right, wherever they're accepted, they are a form of payment and money. Right, you kids probably use Venmo. Right, another form of of situation. The problem is we have these digital currencies that don't talk to each other. Try to put Venmo in your bank account, right? That from your Venmo balance to your bank account balance, right? Wait one to three days or pay a fee, right? Why is it 175 basis point fee? Because they can, right? It's costing them about three cents through something called a Visa direct debit. That's how they move the money backwards um, as a technical matter. The problem in society isn't going to be solved by creating a new type of digital currency, one run by the Federal Reserve without a direct account to the Federal Reserve. Keep in mind, the Federal Reserve, when it talks about a central bank digital currency, is adamant they will not provide you the account. There will have to be an intermediary that provides you that account, and then they have to get their services and costs paid for, right? Profit, nonprofit, however you want to do it. So the point there on central bank digital currency is explain to me why swapping the first C from commercial to central is an advantage 
and then I'm open-minded, right? It, it, we have a lot of digital currencies. Commercial banks do a good job with it. Non-banks have digital currencies. Princeton has a digital currency. Right? What we have a problem with is how the digital currencies communicate, interact, and the speed at which people can move them. Again, if you always have money on your PAW account, you always have money in your bank account, you always have money in this account and that account, it doesn't matter. What it matters is when you become illiquid, when, when you approach that zero lower bound in each of these accounts, and then the fees start to come up. And that's a situation. So what's a more egalitarian society look like? One, there's no, why is an overdraft 35 bucks? Do you know why? It has nothing to do with the cost of the product from the bank. It has to do with the fact that they wanted to get, make it a penalty fee so that you wouldn't do it. Bad, tisk tisk. you ran over your account. Okay. Then they realize, well, wait a second. This <laughs> makes a lot of money for me, <laughs> right? So you could lower that fee. Bank of America lowered it to $10 more than covers their cost, more than covers, you know, fronting the money for a couple days. You don't want to know what the interest rate is, right? You could create a buffer. You can go up to $50 negative, right? JP Morgan Chase, PNC, a lot of other folks. You can give people 48 hours to settle if you, you have a time. A lot of this is driven by time. My research has shown uh, the majority of consumers can, or 50% roughly can cure their overdraft within 48 hours, right? There are lots of different ways you can you can do this. So that's one. I have a grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, another great Princeton entity, to try and rethink of a financial system from scratch. So rather than doing these piecemeal changes, is there a way to think of a financial system? So hopefully when you have me next on in a couple of years, you'll be able to quote a new paper of mine that is rethought more holistically as opposed to a series of individual problems solved. But that's my answer for you at the moment. Yeah, I, uh, one, one anecdote um, to add that I was jealous of is that I, I had a British friend, and over there I think reg there's a regulation that says that for student accounts they have to allow a certain overdraft. Um, so I looked at his account and it was you know, negative 400 pounds, and he was like, don't worry about it, I can go up to 1,000. And uh, I was certainly jealous of that. Maddie, I think you wanted to ask about um, sort of uh, a before and after on AI as we are wrapping up. We're wrapping up, so I'll try to keep this brief. But I do want to try to combine some of the philosophies that you've shared, some of the theses about what, like, marketing versus substance. Um, and going back to something that you said about AI right before COVID, I think you were talking to UNLV students. Um, and you were exactly right. You had been saying you know, racial bias, for example, is baked into the way that finance and tech work. Um, you gave a bunch of really interesting examples. And then you said you should be so excited about this, but you should also be terrified about this new wave of AI. Looking back to three and a half years ago, how does how do those feelings divvy up inside? And also, when you're looking toward regulation, do you approach this with the same ideas and propositions that you have for financial security and other realms where we have to create or designate agencies with a very particular priority for, for example, tech regulation? Yeah, it's a very good set of questions. And let's start. Do you guys know your credit score? I, I really should. You I sh applied for one. You apl uh, I applied to, to figure it out, but I don't know my FICO. You don't? You're okay. So do you know what, what's the goal of a, like, what's a really good FICO? That Fair Isaac company, right? That's the private company that does FICO. It's like 800. Yeah. Like, yeah. What else is the goal 800? SATs. Why? Why are those the only two things? You can't find me a third. I knew what your answer was going to be because there is no third. Why is 800, right? A thousand makes sense. A hundred makes sense, right? We live in a base 10 society, right? We, mathematically, we could live in a base eight. We could live in a base 12. Most people think we have a base 10 because of the number of fingers we have, not because of, of you, know, right, right. I, I, you know, I think computer science is mostly based 16 in certain areas. Why? I'll tell you why, in my opinion. You believe 800 is a great SAT, because it is. And FICO picked that to subconsciously get into your mind that it is valuable. When, when you all graduate from Princeton, right, we can look at your Princeton GPA and your incoming SAT. Are we going to find a correlation? No. It's predictive your freshman year. That's true, broadly speaking. I haven't done Princeton's individually. But SAT is predictive of your freshman year GPA and not of your senior year. But it's used in determining admission. So FICO is somewhat similar, in my opinion. FICO is heavily used in rationing credit. 
how predictive it is, there's lots of new data and new information that is more predictive. If I knew your average daily balance in your bank account, for example, over the last two years, some great work from the financial regu uh, uh, FinReg Labs has shown that that can be as or more predictive than FICO. FICO is a form of artificial intelligence. It is an algorithm that comes up with its own thing and, you know, it, it, it's been grandfathered in the system legally, statutorily, and through regulation in a way in which it's not clear to me it meets the legal anti-discriminatory requirements. However, when new artificial intelligence, when new algorithms are brought in, they're held to a what I believe is a higher legal standard of non-discrimination. Now, I ask you, right, we should have a goal to have some level of non-discrimination, but there's also, right, some level of cross-subsidization, right? You, people believe in risk-based pricing. If you're a riskier credit, you should be charged more. If you're a safer credit, well, how do you determine risky, how not? Some of this is baked in and, and structurally put in. Other parts are legislatively protected. The difference about what is legislatively protected and what is allowed varies by financial product. And this is something people don't fully appreciate. So, uh, 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 Matt, I'm going to give you a set of facts. Um, you are a safer credit risk because of your gender. Women, all factor control for everything else, women tend to be less likely to default than men. It is illegal for a lender to give you a better rate because you're a woman. Gender is not permitted. Now, here's the second part. You're, when you turn 16... You were given a lower car insurance rate, right? Your parents, if, if, if your parents paid for your car insurance, paid more, right? Maybe you couldn't drive to the 17 in New York. Is that it? Don't have a car, don't have insurance. There so you go. It's a moot point, but I, I, I see where you You see where I'm headed, right? <laughs> where I'm headed is that knowing nothing other than the gender of teenage kids. Women are less likely to wreck their car. Teenage boys not always make the smartest choices let's be honest it is completely legal in the field of insurance car insurance in most states not all but most to gender segregate pricing and everybody's parents of teenagers know this and we accept it why because we don't want to cross subsidize so think about this different financial product credit versus insurance but they're both financial products they're both important right you need both to live in, in 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 many dimensions and yet one allows gender-based pricing and one doesn't society is not consistent on what level of cross-subsidization we want to allow in terms of what types of class we want to protect there are different laws and each industry comports with the law insurance is state regulated most states allow it a few states when they tried not to allow it the women got mad the rates went up <laughs> <laughs> and uh, why am I cross-subsidizing this guy who's driving like, you know, uh, a maniac? So I think at this moment in society, we're faced with a technological revolution of extremely sophisticated models. And we have to ask ourselves, what do we want? Well, ultimately, I think we all want some difficult combination of the untenable, which is risk-based pricing without discrimination which you don't fully know, right? You don't know. They're risky female drivers. They're safe guy drivers, right? But in the aggregate, all I know is you're 16. You just got your keys, right? You're behind the wheel. I don't have a record. I don't have a history. I could try to use some proxies. Are you in the honor roll, right? There are some proxies that are used, but they're poor proxies. And so one group says, well, we need to have high standards and we should do that. That's a reasonable position. One group say, well, let the market decide. Well, the market's not maximizing these principles. The market's maximizing profit. Very different set of principles. Uh, I like to think about policy as a world of improvement. Are we better off or are we worse off? So I have this little matrix that I use in, in, in the UNLV talk at Brookings Mountain West, other places where I say, let's start with the origin in this two dimensions of discrimination and profitability. Are you more discriminatory or are you more profitable? And let's say, let's start with credit allocation and the origin is FICO, what we all use today. If I can come up with something that's more predictive and less discriminatory, 
That should be a win. Industry can make more profit. People who are against cross-subsidization can be happy. Uh, and people who are against discrimination can be happy. However, if you do that, it will still be discriminatory based on an abstract measure. Why? Because we're starting at a, at a system that's highly discriminatory, right? The stats of African Americans who have prime credits and different things like that, right? For, we have a multi-generational history of things that have been baked into the system. And that is difficult. It is a difficult structure to accept that level of discrimination that is improvement because you're very subject to the criticism. Wait a second. You're, you're allowing a new system that I can mathematically prove to you is discriminatory. It's like the Pareto improvement almost. That's right, but it's not Pareto optimal. Right. And I really respect the people who have a different intellectual opinion, which is no, we shouldn't, we shouldn't do that. That's just not where I come out. I, I don't want to let the perfect be the enemy of the good. I don't want to let a better, uh, perfect society delay an improving society. Time has cost. Uh, but I can, I can understand people that don't want to, to, to go down that road and want to hold to a higher standard and think we can leapfrog and think we can get further along. As, as I said earlier, you know, different people can have different conclusions based on the same principle of wanting a better society, just coming at it from a different way. Where I think we need to be sure is we don't get something that is more discriminatory, right, and less profitable, Right, that that you know more right, and this type of thing, and maybe it's not the same on everything, right? I'll, I'll you know I'll close with this kind of question on health insurance, right? We say you know what, if you choose to live a less healthy life, you need to pay for it. You want to smoke, you pay more for life insurance. But what if you uh, we outlawed discrimination on the basis of genetics? So an insurance company can sequence your genome pretty cheaply and determine your risks of certain cancers, regardless of your lifestyle choices, right? Just your inherited risks of cancer. And we've said you can't price based on genetics, but you can price based on behavior. That allows a type of cross-subsidization, right? We're going to have people with quote unquote less cancer risk in their genes subsidize people who have more cancer. I'm okay with that. Society has voted to have that. But we have to acknowledge our cross-subsidization and then we lead into difficult questions about where you're going to uh, put this line where we're not going to have cross-subsidization. What is behavior and what is not? I use smoking and genetics because I think we can both agree one is, but you know, they are, smoking is based on a set of cultural and societal factors that are not entirely within your control and genetics are not entirely dispositive, et cetera. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Yeah, and so... Uh the name of this podcast is Policy Punchline. And so to finish off, we like to ask our, our guests to leave us with one punchline uh, for our listeners, and particularly coming from Princeton's School of International and Public Affairs. Um, if you could leave us with one punchline for today, what would that be? Uh, if I, I think what I would say to the students who are, who are listening, which is do more during your time at college. Go to the extra lecture. Sign up for a prospect hall dinner. Do these types of things because you have an opportunity and a gift. Having been in this institution, there were a lot of other people that wanted this slot, and you got it through a combination of hard work uh, and luck. And use these opportunities because when you get into the real world, Right. There aren't people who are just coming to give you lectures and and and, and have fancy dinners and sit around and, and, and talk to you. Use these opportunities and try to make the world a better place. There are a lot of different ways. I had a calling for public policy. Uh, I felt that calling when I was young, growing up in in Montgomery County, Maryland, and it changed me. There are only two occupations I've ever heard people talk about callings for. Right. The uh, uh, divinity and public service. I've never met somebody who said I had a calling to be an investment banker. Now, that's fine. There are ways to make the world a better place in finance. There are ways to make the world a better place in anything you do. It doesn't have to be through government. It doesn't have to be through policy, right? It can be in your community. It can be in your society. But you, everybody here is coming from some level of privilege from your time at Princeton, whether you were privileged before coming here or as a result of this. Use that to make the world a better place. Because you have an opportunity to do that in whatever framework or way you want. Uh, there are no wrong answers as to how you make the world a better place. 
The wrong answer is if you choose not to because you were given this opportunity and somebody else, if they'd been given this opportunity, could have. And so it, it is incumbent upon you to try to make the world better in whatever way. Don't just use this opportunity for your own personal enrichment. You can have some of that too, but you have to give back to the broader community, uh, whether that's the Princeton community, whether that's your local community, whether that's the global community. But you have to give back as a fear uh, because of this privilege you've been afforded. You've been listening to Policy Punchline, a podcast generously supported by the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance at Princeton University. We would also like to encourage you to follow other podcasts produced by Princeton University, such as Politics and Polls by the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. Policy Punchline is intended to be informational only and does not reflect nor represent the views of Princeton University or the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance. For more information on subscription, donation, volunteering, or contact, please visit policypunchline.com. Thank you again for listening.